I want to talk about first things first. Where's your priorities? Look in that text that was read, Luke chapter 9, and there's some remarkable things that are stated here, and, and they're almost shocking in, in, in the way in which they're, they're, they're stated. As they journeyed on the road, someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. You know how easy, how easy it is to say words? Sometimes that sinner's prayer that sometimes people pray, it, it, it lasts about as long as, as the saying of that. There's far more in a relationship with God than just some little statement that you make. Lord, I'll follow you anywhere that you go. And Jesus says, the foxes have holes, the birds have, of the air have their nests. Son of man doesn't have a place to lay his head. What's he trying to say? He's trying to say, you need to understand the cost that is going to give you to, to follow me. And another one, uh, then he said to another, follow me. And the man said, I will. I got to go home and bury my dad first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead, but go and preach the kingdom of God. Wow, is that startling? Is that sobering in, in, in the response? That you, that's not the response that you'd expect Jesus to make at that time. And then the statement is, another one said, Lord, I'll follow you. Let me first go and bid them farewell who are in my house. And Jesus said, okay, that's good. No, that's not what he said. Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Do you hear this? Listen to the words that he said, let the dead bury their dead. And he says by implication to this sect, to the third man that comes to him, that you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven if that's where you are in relationship to this. Folks, Christ is serious about Christianity. And so I want us to talk about, to talk about what's number one in your life. Who's number one there? Well, uh, when you think of number one, what do you think of? Well, I think of football poles is what I think of. don't want to bring up anything that might be painful to anybody else. But when you talk about who's number one, you think about uh, sports teams. Who's going to win the World Series? The Olympics are coming up. Who's going to, you know, is, um, is Michael Phelps, is he going to get all of those medals again? Who's going to win this race? Uh, who's going to win the medal count? We're always concerned about, uh, about that. Do you remember uh, your first little sweetheart and how she said to you, I love you more than anything else in the world? You may have a memory sometime of your wife saying that sometime in the past or maybe your husband saying, saying that sometime in the past. You know, you know what that means? It means that I'm really, really special and somebody really loves the one. I'm number one in their life. But the tragedy is that person who's saying that may even be self-centered himself because he may not respond it back to his wife in that time. You know, uh, it, it may be a statement of being self-centered because there are far too many people, people in this world who are self-centered. And listen, if you're self-centered, you don't have your priorities straight. And that's really the design of this lesson is to help each of us talk about what are the priorities in our life because Christianity is not something that is self-centered. Christianity is something that is Christ-centered. So if you're here today and you're here and, and, and the focus of why you're here has to do with yourself and what others might think of you or what might be accomplished by being here or that you might be able to see somebody while you're here, you've got to back off from that. Christianity is not self-centered, it's Christ-centered. And I had to look this up because I couldn't remember much ado about nothing where that came from. Too many years since high school Shakespeare. Well, you remember the Shakespearean play, Much Ado About Nothing? Uh, what, what about that expression, majoring in minors? Or that expression, getting the cart before the horse? You know what those expressions are? Sometimes we just waste our time on things that really, really do not matter. At the moment, at the moment, it seems like it, all, it, it, it is all that matters. 
At that very instant, it seems like there's nothing else on earth more important than this. And that's probably what Jesus was talking to that individual whenever he said, let the dead bury the dead. Maybe his father was still alive. And he said, let me just go home and wait for my dad to die. He's an old man. And maybe I can wait until he dies. And Jesus says, hello, there's something more important than that kind of relationship. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he says, wait a minute. Don't you know the foxes have, have uh, 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 dens and the birds have, have, have their nests? I don't want, are you sure you really want to follow me? And that's what Jesus is trying to say to us. And so the figure of that individual following or t- starting to plow the furrow. I've never, I've never uh, plowed a furrow ever in my life, but I grew up in a world in a generation that did. That old farmer would say, you, you get old Bessie, and Bessie would be the mule that he had. And, you know, uh, most mules I knew back then were named Dan. I hated that. I didn't know anybody. <laughs> I'm so glad there's so many Dans in this world. I'm glad there are a lot of Dans. In, listen, when I was growing up, only Dans I knew were hound dogs and mules, okay? <laughs> and so he, get, he says, I get behind, here's Bessie. And I want to plow back over in that direction. And, and, and if I'm going to make a straight furrow, and so all of the lines of corn or beans or whatever line up, what I do, I pick me a marker over there, and I, I look at that marker, and I never, ever, ever look back the whole time Dan is going. I make sure he's headed toward that marker over there. Jesus said, now you start that, and then you start looking back. Guess where the plow is going to go? And that's what he's trying in a vivid way to talk about us in our life. Where's your marker over there? What's, what's really at the top of your list in, in, in the priorities of your life? So let's look at some of those priorities in our life. You know the answer to this. What is the first and greatest commandment? I'm not putting any verses on the screen, but you might want to take your pew Bible or your own Bible and look up in Mark chapter 12. You know the story, do you not? In Mark chapter 12 is, is where that individual came to Jesus and, and said to him in verse 29, he said, he said to him, Lord, what's the first commandment of all? Now, you think of all of the Ten Commandments. Which one of those is most important? You think of the fact that the Jews had counted how many commandments there were in the Bible. They found out there were 613. That's Jewish count. I have never counted up the commandments in the, in the Old Testament. But they'd figured out how many commandments there were in the Bible. And evidently it was a matter of great concern to them. And they said, now of all of those commandments that are there, which is the most important thing God ever said? By the way, that's not a bad question, is it? And Jesus is not a bad person to ask that question. Here are all of the commandments that are there. Tell me, Lord, of everything that God has ever said. And you go look at all of the 39 books of the Old Testament, which is the books they would have had. Of all of those things that are there, give me the highlighter and let me highlight the one verse that is the most important one. Which one is first? Well, we'd better get it right, shouldn't we? If this is the most important thing God ever said, we need to understand the answer to this question. Well, you know the answer. And that is, the the answer is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Now, I want you to hear that. With all of your heart and your soul, with all of your soul and your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, this is the first commandment. We've got to get it right. Have you got it right? Are you listening? Did you get it right? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength. That's it. Now, look at Colossians chapter 3. There Paul writes to the church at at Colossae and and he says something that that, that is really, really important in the application of that when he says, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Does this have priorities? 
If you've, been, if you've been baptized, you've been raised with Christ. And then he says, that place that is above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your affection, set your mind on things above and not on things on this earth. Isn't that remarkable? Here's the greatest commandment. And the Lord says, you fix your mind on those things that are above. Let's get back to Dan and the mule the man plowing, he has a goal over there. And Paul says, not using a plow illustration, but he says, you fix your mind. You set your mind, set your affections on those things that are above and not on things on this earth. You stop and think for just a moment of the difficulty of this and yet the importance of it. That's why this lesson is important. Where's your affection set? You look a little bit later in this chapter, he says that when Christ shall appear in verse 4, who is our life, you will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are upon this earth. And then he begins to list some of the aspects of the desires of the flesh, including the matter of covetousness, which has, has to do with materialism. And he says, that's idolatry. And because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Because of what? Because people can get so wrapped up in the application in our day, not just the sexual sins of, of adultery and fornication and evil desires and passion, but so fixated on material things that we lose sight of all that is spiritual that is there. Well, let me ask you a question. What's the greatest, what, is there anything greater than your most basic needs? Let me see if I can illustrate. If I could come and take one, of thing of, one thing out of your house today that you didn't need, what would you give up first? Don't talk about your children now. If, 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 I, if I could say, what would you give up first out of your house? Well, there's that old television that, you know, we don't use. It's down the other part of the house. In fact, I would, I would just get it out there and put it in the dumpster somewhere, but I don't know. I'm just going to hang on to it. You give that, oh yeah, I'd give that up in a heartbeat. You, you, you look at the, the clothes that are in the closet and some of them are too small and you look at shoes and you haven't thrown them away. You, you, don't, you don't know why you haven't thrown them away. You haven't worn them, you know, in, in forever. Would you get, yeah, I'd get rid of all of that. Well, well, you know, what, what would you get rid of? Well, I'd get rid of the, the, the furniture in the, in the other bedroom down there. We don't ever use that. And, and, well, all, all of that furniture that's down there, let's get rid of that. What else are you going to give up? What would be the last thing you'd give up? I believe that you and I will agree, ultimately, if we'll think about it, along about lunchtime, I think we'd, fill, we'd, we'd figure it out just immediately. Isn't that right? Last thing you'd give up would be food and clothes. We don't feel this down here in Florida that much, but up in the cold weather, can you imagine having, clo having enough clothes to keep your body warm? In food and raiment, about the last thing that you would ever give up. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 24, You cannot serve God and mammon. And, and, and that is riches. And then he immediately goes from that and, 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 and he says, now therefore don't you worry about some things. And he talks about food and raiment. The most basic thing, the most fundamental things that are on this earth. And he says, but there's something more important than food and raiment. If I start this verse, you'll be able to finish it, will you not? Seek ye first. You know verse 33, don't you? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. There's something more important than food and raiment. Well, as we think about these priorities in our life, what are those things that can hinder us? Well, have we not already looked at Luke chapter 9 of the, the guys who came to Jesus and said, let me go bury my father, let me go bid family farewell? In, in Luke chapter 14, there's a parable that, that Jesus teaches. Luke chapter 14, verse 15, 
He tells of this man who made this great marriage feast, a great supper, and sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, all things are now ready. And with one accord they began to make excuses. We understand this parable has to do, we'll look in verse, verse 15, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he starts talking about, about a great supper that a man gave. And he says, everything's ready. Come to the feast. And they with one accord began to make excuses. Here is an invitation to a feast, to a supper prepared by some great man. And the spiritual implication of it is it's the Lord Jesus because in verse 15 he talks about eating in the kingdom of God. What on earth would take priority over eating with a king or more importantly, what would take priority over eating with the king? And here it is. The first one says, I bought some ground. The second one says, I bought five yoke of oxen. And the third one said, I married a wife. And they did not come. You know, there are three things that are involved in this. There is family. I married a wife. And I cannot come. Did not Jesus say that if you're going to come to me, and if you love your mother and father more than me, you're not worthy of me. You want to measure the kind of love you need to have? Do you know the heartache that you have when a mother or a father dies and the emptiness that is there? Why? Because I love them so much. I need them so much in my life. Well, what about when the Son of God is there? Think about Him dying for us. And we can sing about it and we can commune around the table sometimes in relationship to it. And yet Jesus said, as great as that love is for mother or father, it cannot take priority. I've seen people not become Christians because they'd say, if I become a Christian, my family won't have anything to do with me. I want you to think about that and the blessings that you may have in your family and may God bless you. The matter of buying the land, I have no idea why this businessman would go out and buy the land, but business can get in the way. Things that are important in our lives, those things that are there, you and I need to understand that while they're important, there are times in our life in which we need to say no to things that are important, that we may have time to say yes to things that are more important. Does not the Lord talk about that seed that fell among the thorns and it was good ground, it grew good fruit, except it had thorns in there and that which grows good fruit will grow good thorns. And he says, and that which is represented by the thorns in that ground, in that heart that has the Word of God planted in it, that which will choke the Word of God out are cares and riches and pleasures, none of those sinful in and of themselves. But there's a priority that is involved. And so there is everything that he mentions. He mentions family and he mentions business. And he mentioned just this property that is out there, the oxen and everything that's involved in it. Where are you today? Is there time that we need to just stop and sit back and think about where am I today in relationship to priorities in my life? In the book of Revelation, we find, I believe, the answer to how to rekindle the fire that's burned out. Revelation chapter 2, there was a church and doctrinally it was as sound as could be. Paul had warned the elders there that false teachers are going to arise and then Paul had gone away and then John later writes this letter to, to the church at Ephesus and guess what? When those false teachers had arisen, Revelation chapter 2, Paul says, there were false apostles that were there and you tried them and you found that they were false. 
And there were those who dealt, held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And he says, you hate them and I hate them. They were doctrinally okay. They were still meeting. They were still serving the Lord. Intellectually, they had the relationship to the Lord. But the Lord says in verse 4 and 5, I have this against you. And that is, you've lost that first love. You've left your first love. In the first reading of that, you might think that what they had left was they'd left the Lord. They loved the Lord first. That's not what he's talking about because they were still God's church there in Ephesus. They were still a functioning entity. People were still members of the church, and yet they had lost their first love. What does that mean? I've used this illustration in, in the past, but it's the clearest illustration I know. A friend by the name of R.T. Rivers discussing this passage says, Car Carlene and I on our honeymoon were out walking one night, and it was cool, and I said, Carlene, honey, you're, you left your coat. Here, take my coat. And he said, I took my coat off, and I put my coat around her, and I hugged up on her, and, I, and as we walked along, I said, now, are you all right? Are you all right? He said, now, I still love Carlene, but if we were out walking tonight, and I noticed she didn't have a coat, I'd say, woman, what on earth is wrong with you? And you got enough sense to bring a coat with you on a cold night like this? That's first love. You know what first love is? Remember the day you became a Christian? Remember the joy that you had? Remember the first time you ever ate the Lord's Supper? Remember the first time in your life that there was those great times in your life and there was a love that was there that, that, that was just so amazing. Lord, I'm going to serve you. Lord, I'm going to do everything that I can. Lord, I'm never, ever, ever going to let up. Lord, I promise you that I'm going to really live zealously for you. Folks, that's first love. You know what second love is? It's when I develop the attitude, well, I have to go to church today. Instead of, I get the chance to praise God with godly people today. That's first love. I have to go to church. I have to give. I hope we don't sing every verse of every song. And for sure, I hope he doesn't preach that long. And for, I don't want him to preach about giving either. You remember the first time as a Christian you sang? You remember the invitation song that was sung when you, the night you came or the day you came to become a Christian? Remember the emotional relationship you had with that? First love. And so here's this church that it had its priorities together and they had left it. They were still a church. They were still Christians in Ephesus the church of Christ was right there in, in the city of Ephesus. And the Lord says, you know how to get back there? Repent and do your first works. Why don't you in your mind just decide the next song we sing, I'm going to sing it like I just did when I first became a Christian. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. And sing that song like it's the first time you've ever sung it. But not that song. But just resolve in your heart that your attitude toward everything that's involved in spirituality, reading the Bible, praying every day, enjoying being around the people of God, participating in every aspect of worship, and go back and say, I'm going to do it just like I'm a brand new babe in Christ. And that's God's remedy. Repent and do your first works. Go back and do it like you used to do it when you had it together. 
And so the baseball player starts the season and he's in a slump, is he not? And he goes 0 for 300 in his first 300 at bats. Well, <laughs> that's pretty bad, Joe. <laughs> you know what he's got to do? Get back to the fundamentals. He goes back and looks at those videos when he was hitting the ball out of the park, you know, every fifth or sixth at bat. Isn't that remarkable? That's how you do it. And spiritually, that's how you do it. You see, you've got to go back and refocus. And that's the whole purpose of this lesson. Where's your priorities? God help us, as we've talked about these things, that we'll not let anything get in our way. You know those first works that you did when, when, when you made your first steps in faith? When because you believed in Jesus, John chapter 3 and verse 16, you made up your mind to repent and to confess your faith in Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse 10, and Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, both talk about the, that you need to acknowledge that you believe Jesus is the Son of God. And then Acts 2, 38, you can be baptized for the remission of your sins, and the most remarkable thing happens. The Lord adds me to the church. You know, remember the church of Christ? It's what you need to do. Why? It's what they did in Bible times to be a member of the church. They believed. They made up their minds to follow the Lord. They confessed their faith in Jesus and they were baptized and God washed away every sin that they'd ever committed. Now most of you today have already done that. You know what he says to us? Don't you let up. That faith that you had that allowed you to become a Christian when you believe with all of your heart that Jesus was the Son of God and you made up your mind, He's going to be number one in my life, I'm going to commit my life to Him, then you be full of that faith. Be full of that faith until the day that you die. How can this church help you go to heaven? Won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing. We